history is in the making as former President Donald Trump is on trial over hush money payments made to Stormy Daniels leading into the 2016 presidential election. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. And that's why I'm very proud to be here. This is an assault on our country. Trump is facing 34 felony counts related to allegations he falsified business records to conceal the hush money payment. This is one of four criminal trials the former president is facing, but the only one that is guaranteed to finish before the upcoming election. But the big question is, how will voters react if he is convicted? It's time to go on the record with Scott Tranter, Director of Data Science from Decision Desk HQ. Scott, thanks for joining me. I want to kick it off with a new Reuters poll that shows 64% of registered voters view Trump's charges as at least somewhat serious. Are we seeing this trial really impact any recent polling no numbers coming out of major swing states? Yeah, no, it's interesting. And that the Reuters poll kind of backs up what we see when we look at some of the cross tabs, right? If you're a staunch Democrat, you have an opinion about the trial. If you're a staunch Republican, you have an opinion about the trial. It's really that middle independent swing, those types of voters. We see that, especially in the non-affiliated independents. They think 50 to 60 percent of them think that if he's convicted, it will affect their vote. Now, again, question wording, all that other kind of stuff. But bottom line, if he's convicted in this case, they're going to at least um, take another look at their opinion of him. You know, we're about eight months away from Election Day, which is really an eternity in modern day politics. Do you think we will see any long term impact to Trump's White House chances if he's convicted? You know, I got throwbacks to 2016 where every week it was a new political scandal with Donald Trump. And everyone's like, oh, this is the week where, you know, whatever he said or whatever he did, this is going to bring him, you know, what the term was political gravity is going to bring him back down to normal. That didn't happen in 2016. That didn't happen during his uh, presidential um, dur during his presidency. He had a he had a similar experience in 2020. It was very close. I don't necessarily think that this is going to be the one thing that brings him down or brings most of his poll numbers down. And I think the bounce back. I mean, the trends tell us that he he does bounce back from from stuff like this, especially if he's convicted in something as high profile as this. There's going to be another story the next week, and he's obviously going to campaign against that, which which tends to work for him. So, you know, I, I don't see this as a as, you know, eight months out is something that 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 will stick over seven or eight months, um, especially given how crazy this campaign season is going to be. But this is considered one of the least serious criminal cases the former president is facing nationwide. Are we seeing his base rallying behind Trump or is it starting to fracture? You know, it, it, that's another good, good question. When we combine it with the polling data and the polling data says that, you know, if he's convicted, he loses some of those independents. On, on the flip side, his base, the Republicans, you know, staunch Republicans, they give more money. Now, when you ask them in focus groups and things like that, they do say, that, look, you know, this is this is tiresome. We think these are a lot of them think they are witch hunts. They agree with them, but but they're they're sick and tired of, of dealing with this. There's some weariness, um, sympathetic weariness about it. But by and large, you know, th these types of things are good campaign rallies for him, and he does fundraise around it. So at least it shows that he's rallying his base around this. Decision Desk has President Biden trailing Trump by 0.6 percent. Have we seen any major changes since last week in the polling? Not a whole lot. What I would say is over the uh, over the last month, you know, five weeks uh, s since the State of the Union, this uh, this average has gotten closer. You know, right before the State of the Union is about a point and a half, two points off. And so, you know, some might say, hey, it's only moved a point. But you got to remember, we're having one or two polls a month under this average. So it moving a, a whole point over the course of a month is is a big shift change. Um, I'd like to say it's also cor correlated with the fact that the, the Biden campaign is spending a lot of money now. You know, they're the only campaign up in some of these swing states with some with some TV ads. And now they're not at four, full force like they're going to be this September, October. Um, but Biden is in campaign mode. And so, you know, we're seeing that average tighten. If you want a prediction, 
I think, you know, a month, two months from now, we're going to see Biden probably take the lead as he spends more money. And here's another prediction after that. I think Trump, as he starts spending money, he's going to take the lead back. Like this is going to be a back and forth for the next seven or eight months. I'm glad you brought up Biden's State of the Union because the president is seeing a boost in his approval number, hitting 43 percent in a new poll from the Financial Times and the University of Michigan's Ross School of Business. What's helping the president gain momentum with Americans? Does it just go back to the State of the Union or is there something more at play? I, I, he is out there campaigning more. And I think that's that's the big piece here is he is out there spending money. He's out there giving campaign style speeches. He's out there doing campaign style events in some of these swing states. You know, he's been in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin recently. Um, you know, he's out there trying to move these numbers and getting his name out there. Uh, now, 43% is, is is an improvement for him, but it's still well below the 50, which is where you'd like an incumbent president to be. Uh, but this is certainly a whole lot better, better numbers for him than where he was, say, six weeks ago. I want to move on to one of my favorite battleground states, Pennsylvania. Trump was in the Keystone State over the weekend, and Biden is there this week. Who's leading there, and how close is this race going to be? There's a hefty chunk of um, electoral college votes up for grabs in PA. Oh, man, PA is going to be one of those those states, and they sometimes take a little while to count. That is That is one of the states that we're going to be watching this fall. Who's ahead? Look, the polling averages say right now, um, Trump is ahead, certainly well within, well within the margin of error. And that's another state. If we talk about it week in, week out, we could see Biden up one week, Trump up the next. It's going to go back and forth. And it's one of those states, you know, if you ask me to bet on who the winner is, I wouldn't bet because it's too close and it's going to keep going back and forth. Yeah, absolutely. Moving on to the third party candidate everyone's talking about, RFK Jr. He posted on X that Trump aides reached out to him about joining Trump as his VP. If this were to happen, and that's a big if, how much of an impact could it make? Oh, you know, I, I chuckled at that. I don't know how true that is. It seems a little weird to me. And I yeah. think that's kind of what the Trump campaign said. But, you know, I love campaigns, right? You got all these these crazy storyline storylines. I, right now, the polling RFK seems to take appears to take a little bit more away from Joe Biden than Donald Trump, and, and a lot of it is uh, interestingly enough, it's it's two parts of the of the voter electorate. It's some of these younger people um, looking for a, a real alternative here, or at least you know it appears a real alternative, and it's some of these these much older voters who who identify with with the Kennedy name. And so, you know, if he were to go on the ticket, he'd certainly get a whole lot more profile and a whole lot more, um, uh, you know, awareness among the voters. And once you get that awareness, then people start understanding what his views are. And I think he'll probably tilt a little more Republican as that comes out. Um, I think it could certainly help Donald Trump. Um, I don't know exactly how, you know, whether his 7% is going to go all the way forward. I know that's that looks how it would work uh, on paper, but that's not how it's probably going to work in practice. I do know this. He's probably not going to get 7% nationwide, mm. but even if he gets 1% or 2% in a state like Pennsylvania or Wisconsin or something like that, that is going to make a difference. And so, you know, he could be good on anyone's ticket. And so I get I get I get the uh, I get the appeal. Um, I don't think it'll happen, but but it, it certainly makes him a factor. But Democrats still say they're worried about our RFK Jr. making it on the ballot in these additional states. To your point, is Trump's strategy tr to essentially prop up RFK Jr. at this point, and how is he doing it? Yeah, I know. The, look, the, the, the math is this. Right now, it appears that RFK takes more votes from Biden than he does Trump. So if that's the case, then yes, you want to make sure that RFK is on the ballot in states like Pennsylvania, like we just talked about, Wisconsin, Arizona, Georgia, you know, and RFK is, has has shown that he has the ability to, you know, get the signatures and organize and do that. He's going to be on some of these states. So that that's certainly, you know, on paper, that's a good strategy for the Trump campaign um, because the math works out. I don't know how long that math is going to work out because, again, the Biden campaign is spending money. They have a whole team behind, you know, campaigning against him. And as more and more voters learn about RFK's positions, some of them tend to, uh, the Republicans tend to sh shift towards him 
for a couple of different reasons. So, I, you know, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. Right now, that math makes sense. We'll see if that math makes sense in September. So speaking of that math, we've been tracking that three-way race between Biden, Trump, and RFK Jr. recently. You know, have there been any significant changes recently, or have you just been seeing, you know, that conventional wisdom that RFK tends to take more from Democrats than Republicans at this point? Yeah, it's right now it's that conventional wisdom. But what I would say this is when we, you know, we talk about RFK almost every week. He's he's a fascinating political story. And now that he's he's getting on the ballot in some places, someone to watch, his average has gone down. You know, when we were talking about him about eight weeks ago, he he peaked at about nine and a half, ten percent in the average. Right now he's sitting at seven percent. So he's gone down quite a bit. Um, you know, if he's, we'll see what the debates, the debate commission and how that works out later this fall. He, you know, if, if rules from, from past presidencies, um, presidential cycles hold up, he needs 15% to enter the debates. He's certainly going to make the argument he belongs in there with less, but his average is going down, um, since we last, you know, he last peaked seven, eight weeks ago. Um, and I think that's a lot because the, the Biden campaign is certainly, um, you know, starting a campaign against him. Um, but he's also raising money. He's going to he's going to campaign. So I could see that bounce up a little bit as well. But the yeah. big trend is he's going down. Yeah, the Biden campaign. I know the DNC is devoting quite a bit of resources also to combating third party candidates. And we know that there's a few others. Scott Tranter, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me.